I think that's it. We're going to bring up Hutch, and let me open us up in prayer. Father, thank you that you are a God of love. Uh, you show us what love is. You so, show us what sacrifice is. And this morning, as we celebrate your love and look farther and deeper into it, open up our hearts. Help us to hear some things. Prick us. Expand us. Holy Spirit, we invite you in. Speak to us as only you can. Uh, we look forward to a great morning in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's give it up for Hutch, the love doctor today, right? Yes. Here you go. Good morning, guys. Good to see you. if you have a Bible or an iPhone or whatever it is you have that you follow along with. Uh, make your way over to Matthew chapter 22. That's our text for this morning. Matthew chapter 22, as we continue in our series, Indispensable, about passing on to the next generation those biblical principles and truths that are absolutely essential. Uh, the argument about the goat, who's the greatest of all time, is an argument that very rarely ever gets settled. For instance, if you're asking who's the greatest football player of all time, would you say it would be, oh, maybe Jim Brown, Walter Payton, Jerry Rice, maybe uh, Lawrence Taylor or Tom Brady? Anybody? Brett Favre. Brett Favre, all right, one vote for Brett, okay. <laughs> How about when it comes to basketball, would you say it's Kobe, LeBron, or Michael? How about baseball? Would you say it's Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, Willie Mays, or Hank Aaron? All right, so there's a lot of debate, all right, on who's the greatest of all time. Well, that's exactly the kind of situation we have here in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is literally just hours away from the crucifixion. It's Wednesday of crucifixion or Passion Week. Yet the day before, on Tuesday, he came into town, went into the temple, overturned the money changers, cleaned house, said, this house is a house of prayer. My father's house is a house of prayer. You have turned it into a den of thieves. So as you can imagine, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were a little upset because this was Passover. This is when they made their greatest profits over the course of a year. And so they're upset. And, and to be quite honest with you, the Sadducees and Pharisees rarely ever saw eye to eye on about anything. The Sadducees were very aristocratic. The Pharisees were commoners. There was great social, political, and theological differences among these guys. For instance, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. Pharisees did. But there was one thing that united the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and that was in their communal hatred for Jesus. I mean, think about it. These were the religious elite leaders of their day. This guy, Jesus, had just a couple of days earlier rode into town on the back of a, of a donkey to praise and adoration and people singing Hosanna. And they were fearful of what he was doing. They were going to lose their place. The people were behind them. The Sadducees and Pharisees wanted to put Jesus in his place. And so Matthew chapter 22 begins with a parable, the parable of the wedding feast. Then there are three questions asked of Jesus by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And then finally, he finishes out that chapter by turning the tables on them and asking them a question. The first question the Pharisees asked was a political question. It had to do with paying taxes. The second question Jesus was asked was by the Sadducees. And they came up with this very elaborate story about a, a man who had a wife and died. And Jesus, isn't the brother supposed to marry the wife and raise up children to the departed brother? And she had seven brothers all the way down. And so they created this huge uh, scenario and they thought they'd trap Jesus theologically in what he said. And then finally, number three was a question, a political question or a theological question that is asked by the Pharisees. Let's look at it together, shall we? Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, that word silenced there literally means gagged, muzzled. And the Pharisees had to be giving each other high fives, realizing that Jesus had shut the mouths of the Sadducees. But the text goes on. Then they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer. Now, it's interesting, that term lawyer is not a term that is normally used <clears throat> by Matthew in his text. Normally, he would use the word scribe. 
It literally means a expert in Mosaic or Hebraic law. And when he says lawyer, what he's probably saying is, is he was the chief scribe. He was the one that was most well-spoken. He was the expert of all the experts in the law. And if anybody could stump Jesus, it was going to be this guy. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Maybe circle, highlight, underline, because that's what they were doing. They were trying to get Jesus to paint himself into a political corner. They were trying to get Jesus to paint himself into a theological corner. Why? So they could discredit him and the crowds would turn against him because they had already been plotting his murder. Verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In asking the question, which is the greatest commandment of the law, literally what this lawyer, this scribe, this Pharisee was asking is, which of Moses' laws was, number one, the greatest? You see, the Pharisees took all of the Old Testament scriptures as authentic. The Sadducees, uh, not so much. They really held highly to the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. And so... <clears throat> The Pharisees and the Sadducees both saw Moses as the greatest biblical character of all time. After all, it was Moses who spoke face to face with God. It was Moses who went up on the top of the mountain and received the handwritten tablets of God. It was Moses who was called by God to lead the nation out of bondage and slavery in Egypt. So Moses was top dog. The Pharisees and the Sadducees often said that they sat in Moses' seat. That was as high of a position in Israel as you could have if you were a Jew. And so Moses without, was without peer when it came to God using him as a human instrument and a divine revelator. So the Pharisees' purpose in testing Jesus was to prove him to be an apostate. You say, Hutch, what's an apostate? An apostate is someone who has turned their back on their religion. So they were trying to get him to go against Moses. Does that make sense? They're trying to discredit him. And over the years, the Jewish rabbis had supposedly determined that just as there were 613 separate letters in the Hebrew Ten Commandments, there also were 1,613 separate laws in the Old Testament scriptures. Now, these rabbis divided these 613 laws into what were considered positive laws and negative laws. A positive law was do this, a negative law was don't do this. They also took these laws and they put them in, in, in uh, lists, if you will, of weightier matters and lighter matters. Now the problem was none of them agreed on which were weighty and which were light. And so they really reveled in the fact that they would sit around doing nothing other than arguing their cause and their case for their list and the position of these laws in that list. It was because that was their motive, that was their goal, that was their passion, that they thought Jesus was coming in with his own agenda. They were looking at it through their lens and they said, this guy, this guy has the crowd behind him. This guy, he's, he's gonna take our position. They're listening to him before they're listening to us. And so Jesus didn't take the bait. As a matter of fact, he used that which both the Sadducees and the Pharisees agreed upon, the law of Moses, to prove his answer that day. Look at verse 37. His answer was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Now, in Jesus' day, if you're a good Jew, you said the Shema 
twice in the morning, once in the morning and once in the evening. The word Shema in Hebrew means hear, to hear with your ears. And the Shema was written in real tiny letters on uh, parchment paper and placed in something called a phylactery. A phylactery was a little box that they wore as a headband around their head or tied to their left hand. This is what men would do when they prayed. They also had things called mezuzahs. And a mezuzah was a little box that you would tie or attach to the doorposts of your home. So in both the phylacteries and the mezuzahs was this Shema. And here is what was in those boxes. Deuteronomy 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, that's the word Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Did you get that? Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. If your family is to know, it's up to you. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Also was written Leviticus 19 and verse 18 that said, you shall love the Lord your God, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The word love in Hebrew is pronounced ahiv, ahiv. It's the Hebrew equivalent of the Greek word agapeo which we know is love. Now in the English language, when we say that we love something, it has a very broad connotation, right? I can say that I love pizza. I love my dog. I love my neighborhood. I love my mom and my dad. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I love my new car. And you see, there's a lot of different kinds of love. And in the context, we can pretty much tell what you're saying. However, the Greek language is much more specific. They had multiple words that describe different kinds of love, like phileo, that was a brotherly love. That's where the name Philadelphia came from, the city of brotherly love, which it's anything but that. Have you been there to an Eagles <laughs> ball game? Uh, another word was eros. Eros was physical, romantic, sexual love. By the way, we do not see that word anywhere on the pages of the New Testament. And then there was agape. Agape was the highest form of love. It was the action-oriented love. It was a love that does. It was intelligent, purposeful love, committed love that seeks the highest good for the person, but notice this, unconditionally. It's a love that's not what's in it for me. It's a love that says... I love you, and I want to do for you. And that's the love that Jesus said we're to have for God and for our brothers. The idea here in Matthew 22, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, literally means we're to love God comprehensively with our entire being, with every part of who we are. You see, in the Hebrew mindset, in the Hebrew way of thinking, the heart referred to the very core of a person's being. The soul is the closest thing to what we would call our emotions. And the mind here, in this sense, is the intellectual, willful, vigor part of a human being. Genuine love for God involves thought, sensitivity, intent, and even action when and where possible. And just as God loves us with his whole being, 
He calls upon you and me as his followers, as his children, to love him with our whole being. His love for mankind was so great that John 3 and verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave an action-oriented kind of love. The distinguishing mark of a true saving faith in God is love for God. The person who truly loves God with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his mind is a person who trusts God and obeys God. 1 John 2, verse 3. And by this, we know that we have come to know him. In other words, this is the telltale sign of a person who has come to faith in Jesus Christ. If we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. Now, isn't it interesting? Jesus was asked one question and yet he gave two answers. After stating the first commandment, Jesus did the Pharisees one better, and he says, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. The two connectors between our love for God and our love for uh, our neighbor is the very nature of this love that we've just talked about. To genuinely love our neighbor, we are to love our neighbor as God loves our neighbor. It is a purposeful, intentional choice that is active, not, near, not merely sentimental or emotional. And it's measured, Jesus said, get this, by how we love ourselves. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So help me out here for a second. When you're hungry, what do you do? Eat. When you're thirsty, what do you do? You get yourself something to drink, right? When you're sick, what do you do? You take medicine, you go see the doctor, you take a nap, you pray. Why do you do those things? Why do you go get something to eat? Why do you go get something to drink? Why do you take medication, take a nap, or go to see a doctor? Because you love, you're, you're caring for yourself, right? That's the picture here. First John 4, verse 7 says this, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. The bottom line here is this. If we as people on this earth would love God and love others the way that Jesus describes for us here, we would need no laws. Because if I loved God with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all of my strength, I would never, ever take his name in vain. If I genuinely loved God, I would never seek to worship anything else but him. I wouldn't be looking for idols. I would have a passionate desire to obey his every word. My intent would always be to glorify him. And if I loved my neighbor, if we loved our neighbor as we loved ourselves, I would never seek to harm my neighbor. I would never seek to take something from my neighbor that belongs to him, right? And so Jesus is saying, here's the deal. It's all about love. Mark chapter 12 is a parallel to Matthew 22. Listen to this text. Mark used the word scribe, and the scribe said to him, get this, this is that lawyer talking back. You are right, teacher. I'm sure Jesus appreciated that. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that, he answered wisely, saw that he answered wisely, he said to them, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now there's a two word question I wanna challenge you to write on your notes at this point. And that two word question is this, so what? So what? 
So what about all this talk about loving God? So what about all this talk about loving your neighbor as yourself? Well, I want to give you three practical action steps that relate to loving God and loving others. Number one, you'll want to write this down in your notes. Love requires action. Love requires action. God is our model of agape love. Remember, he gave his son. He gives us forgiveness of our sin. He gives us the Holy Spirit to take up residence inside of us the moment that we become followers of Jesus Christ. He gives us spiritual gifts to serve him by serving others. I am never more like Jesus than when I give. I give him my praise. I give him my obedience. I give him my absolute surrender. I give him all of my worship. So love requires action, and that action is I give. Now, number two, I'm going to save and finish up after we go to the tables in just a few minutes. So let's break to the tables, have some discussion around this concept of loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. All right, guys, let's get wrapped up here. It's going to be a few minutes longer than usual, so I appreciate your patience. Let's get back to answering that question, so what, shall we? Remember, I'm giving you three thoughts here. Number one, love requires action. Number two, you'll want to write this down. If I'm to love others as God commands, I must have a God-honoring love of myself. If I'm to love others as God commands, I must have a God-honoring love of myself. You see, all that I am, all that I have is from God. I can take no responsibility for the family that I was born in. I can take no responsibility for the beat of my heart. God holds all of that in his hand. And so I must learn what is it that God says about me? What is it that God believes about me? And this is not an exhaustive list, but it is an important list. So write these things down. Number one, I am loved. I am loved. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace you have been saved. So number one, I am loved. Remind yourself of that. Number two, I am his masterpiece. I am his masterpiece. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for we are his workmanship. That word workmanship is uh, our English word for poem. It's a, it, it really means a work of art. We're the Mona Lisa, if you will, of, the, of God's eye. We are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Have you ever considered the fact that you are a masterpiece? You are a work of art. By the way, guys, if you have a daughter still living at home, tell her that. 
And when you think you've told her enough, tell her about 10 times more. Because we live in a world today where she's going to get beaten and berated and bullied. She's going to look at magazine covers and what's on TV screens and on billboards. And she's going to think to herself, I don't match up. Without thinking the fact that they've been filtered and sprayed and cleaned up and you understand what I'm saying it's 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 tell your boys that too tell your boy you are a masterpiece my sons are 33 and 31 and you know what I need to tell them that more often just to remind them I'm loved I am his masterpiece number three I am chosen do you remember what it was like black on the in the elementary school when they were choosing up sides for kickball? You remember, you, the worst thing in the world that could happen to you is to get down to the bottom two and not be picked, right? Okay, we'll take Ryan. <laughs> Somebody's got to, might as well be us, right? He's the masterpiece, yes. Thank you for telling him that. As excellent action. We're chosen, guys, listen to this. He chose us in him when before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Uh, the next one, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, or you could say sin, according to the riches of his grace. You remember that long list of things the devil wants to remind you of? When he reminds you of your sins and your past, you remind him of his future. Because if you haven't noticed, it's coming quickly to an end. Next, I am a new creation. I'm a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How about this one? I am redeemed. Do you know what that word redeemed means? The word redeemed means purchase from the slave market of sin. You, you, you've seen it. You've, you've read about it, perhaps the slave market where, where people would bid on another person. Well, Jesus trumps all bids. In him we have redemption. How? Through his blood. That is the price of Jesus paid because that's how valuable you are. And I want to encourage you to be a part of next week as we talk about reconciled. And it'll be a life transforming study. We don't usually talk about what's coming up because when people watch this, they don't watch it all in order. But I want to encourage you. Usually that last one of the session, people like to slough off, do not do it. You will be enriched in your journey of faith as we study God's word and what it says about being reconciled next week. Number three. Number one, love requires action. Number two, I am to love, if I'm to love others as God commands, I must have a God-honoring love of myself. I need to see myself the way that God sees me. Number three, to genuinely love others, we must value others. To genuinely love others, I must value others. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. In humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. That's a pretty radical way to live life, isn't it? In humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. And by the way, when you start doing that, God will give you lots of opportunities. Right? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Can I say a word real quick about pornography here? One of the greatest problems with pornography is is that it desensitizes a man's brain. And unfortunately in our world today, a lot more women are into it as well. But it points us to thinking of people as objects rather than thinking 
that's somebody's daughter. They are loved. They are someone for whom Jesus died. They were not placed on this earth just to visually stimulate and please me. But God has a purpose for their life too. Realize the value of others. We think, we think very highly of ourselves. But God says, here's what I want you to do, guys. I want you to look at that other fella. I want you to look at that other woman through my lens and see what value they bring just because of who they are. 613 laws. You can reduce them down to 10. And then Jesus comes along and he takes that and he reduces it down to just two. Now, I don't know about you, but I bet you you could memorize those two. And if we would start to live life loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and as Mark adds, all of our strength, and love our neighbor as herself, it would smooth a lot of things out in this world, wouldn't it? Father, thank you for your word. It just, uh, Lord, hits us right between the eyes. And Lord, I pray that as we continue to go through the study of these indispensable principles in your word, you would help us to, um, Lord, not just learn them, but do them. Today, help us to walk throughout this day thinking about how we can value others. Thinking about your great love for us. And most of all, thinking about how can we bring honor and glory to you. How we can indeed love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And Lord, we'll be sure to give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, the tables and chairs need to be put up today. I reiterate what Ron said earlier about uh, financially supporting this, if this has been a blessing to you, and you believe in the vision of uh, what we do here to uh, spur men on to walk with God, we would really, really appreciate it. Also, I have some of these wonderful dog treats made by adults with disabilities, and they make great stocking stuff. You should say, Hutch, I don't have a dog. Do you have a neighbor? Do you have family members? And so it'd be a great support for that ministry as well. Thank you for letting me have the mic to say that. But um, God bless you. Listen, I really, 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 really encourage you to be here next week. I am about to jump out of my skin as I'm preparing this, okay? And it is biblically rich. And it will change, change the way you see your salvation, the way you see Christmas, and the way you see the lostness of others around us. So... Uh, it'd be a, if you know somebody that needs Jesus as their personal Savior, it'd be a great Friday to invite them to come because we're going to lay out the gospel and we're going to extend an invitation for them to have a new heart and a new life in Jesus Christ. All right, can we do that? God bless, guys. Love you. We'll see you next week. Bye.